Amen? For the next few minutes, you got to put everything out of your mind. Don't let anything distract you. We're coming to you. You know, it's kind of funny. You know when you go to a restaurant and you eat, boy, and after you order, man, you're sitting there with a group and you got a lot of conversation going on. Everybody's talking. The restaurant's loud and you're laughing and talking. When they set that food in front of you, guess what happens? There ain't no conversation going on. Only thing you hear is chewing and chomping and, and slava. Amen? It gets real quiet, doesn't it? Why? Because there's something in your mouth. You, 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 you're on a mission. You're eating food. That's the way it ought to be when the man or woman of God brings the word of God to you. Everything should be at silent. You should be listening to what God is saying to you. I'm not here to preach you a, a sermon necessarily or teach you a lesson necessarily. When, when you come into this house of God and the man or, or whoever woman stands before you preaches the word of God... This house is a house that speaks forth prophetic words. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so you, got, you can't just listen and hear prophetic words. You've got to grab them. They have to be engrafted into your spirit. You've got to take it and say, that's mine. Amen? Anybody can, can, can do, you know, like I was saying, six steps to so-and-so. You just do the six steps and then hope it works. But I found what works for somebody not, might not work for you. God's not concerned about the destination. He's concerned about the process. Somebody say amen. And so your process may be different. But if we begin to speak through prophetic word, which simply means teaching and all is fine. I'm not talking about the difference in teaching and preaching and all that. I'm saying there's an unction behind it. You hear what I'm saying? There's an unction behind what you're teaching, what you're preaching. And that's what we need in these days. Men and women that are full of God with an unction from the Holy One that speaks forth the, the, the oracles of God. Brings life to people. Somebody say amen. amen. And so I hope to do that today, but you got to be ready. Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. First Kings chapter 17. There's a great famine in the land. How many knows we serve the God that will still take care of you in the middle of famine? One prophet, I told you, one man of God, the Bible says, he sowed in the time of famine and in the same year reaped a hundredfold. Your famine or the famine of lands does not deter God from blessing you. Why? Because he's Jehovah Jireh. Not the economy, not the systems of the world, God is. Somebody say amen. And so, there's a great famine in the land and we hear... Some instruction to the prophet of God. Verse 1, 1 Kings chapter 17. And Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years according to, the word, to my word. Verse 2, the Lord, word of the Lord came unto him, speaking of Elijah, saying, Get thee up hence, and turn eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now let's stop. We're going to break down some scripture as we go this morning. We're going to read a pretty good bit of scripture. We're going to break some things down. It's a famine in the land. Come from the word of the prophet, from the word of the Lord. No rain, no dew for many years. Without rain you can have no harvest. It takes water to bring forth, hit the ground, to bring forth buds and flowers from the grounds so there's no harvest without any rain but God is a God that protects his people if you are in covenant with God Noah my son is he's worried to death about whatever date they said December something supposed to be the end of the world if everybody's saying it you can bet on it it ain't because your Bible says, no man knoweth the time but God Himself. So if everybody knows it, probably not it. So He came to me the other day all worried. Daddy, everybody in school saying December, whatever is the last day. I said, son, 
Don't worry about it. It's not the, the end of the world. Well, it's not going to blow up. Somebody say amen. amen. If it did blow up, before it blew up, there'd be a, a splitting of the clouds and, and in the eastern sky will split open in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Those that are alive and Christians will be gathered up and those that are dead in the graves will be gathered up and we'll meet him in the air. So we're not fearful and not worried about it. If I don't see you tomorrow on earth, I'll see you in glory. Somebody say amen. So we're not worried about it because we serve a God that takes care of his children. He takes care of his people. And in the middle of the famine, he tells Elijah, he said, I want you to go to the brook Cherith. And he said, I've commanded ravens to feed you there. Now what do you think would have happened if he went to the river Jordan? He would have died in famine. What do you think would have happened if he would have stayed there and said, Nah, God, you're a God of covenant. You can just bless me right here. What do you think would have happened? He would have died in famine. The Bible makes it specifically clear that he says, Go to the brook Cherith, for I have commanded ravens to feed you there. We have got to get back into our mentality in our daily lives that our will is an enemy of the will of God. We have got to do God's will for our lives. We've, we've taken too much ownership for our own lives. We forget we have a God. We have a king. With a king, there's no voting. The king sends forth the decree. The people obey the decree. If we do that, we're blessed. Somebody say amen. We've got too much doctrine in our lives. Doctrine is, is watered down religion that we choose to believe. Because there's only one truth. And if it's wrong for me to do something, then it's wrong for you to do something. If it's right for me to do something, it's right for you to do something. Truth is truth no matter the person or the situation. Now I'm preaching better than y'all letting on already. Elijah had to go where God told him to go. If he wasn't there, the ravens would bring bread and bring meat and drop it on the ground with no profit to eat it. But I guarantee you the ravens would have still done what God commanded them to do. Maybe God is providing for you, but you're just not at the place where he told you to be. I'm going to preach to you today. I can go ahead and tell you. Maybe God is a God of covenant and He is keeping His promise to you and ravens are dropping meat and bread on the ground but the only thing missing is you. Because God will keep His end of the bargain. My God, I feel Him in here this morning. He said, go there. I, one thing I just want to inter interject here. I, I don't want to get too prophetic on you this morning but it was prophetic to me and I don't know if you can handle it but I studied that a little bit about this river this creek if you will this branch called the the the, the river the brook Cherith it was a hidden brook that people didn't even know was there it was hidden by a bunch of figs and flowers all the way up and down both sides of the brook and the way that they knew that it was the, the brook Cherith is because there was great rocks and even the rocks produced flowers. They called it the flowery branch. Good God. Boy, I read that and my spirit started leaping up on the inside of me. And God said, maybe, just maybe, I'm sending people to the flowery branch to drink of some water that they can't find anywhere else. Well, that's good right there. Hallelujah. I tell you we're men and women of destiny. You got to shake off those heavy bands and shake off that old mentality and, and that doctrinal uh, religion and realize you are a man and woman of covenant, a man and woman of destiny. Hallelujah. No wonder the enemy's after you so hard. He don't want you to be the flowery branch. He don't want to be able to send people to you and they eat and drink in the time of famine. Good God. Hallelujah. 
People say, you got, you, got, you got that church over there in Flowery Branch, but we watch you on live church, and people, when we were on TV, where people say, my God, your church has got to be thousands. No. They say you preach like you're preaching to thousands. I say, I ain't preaching to thousands. I am pre- but what I got to do is I got to get my people to realize that, that, that there's hundreds in covenant with you and there's hundreds waiting on you and there's hundreds waiting on you and if you'll get to the place there and allow God to use you, this place will multiply and multiply. But we too worried about Pastor David and, and getting Pastor David to, to preach good. And if Pastor David ain't there, we ain't there. The brook still got to flow with water even though if I ain't there. You the brook. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. They knew the brook because the flowers around it. And the, 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 what I was reading specifically says flowery rocks and flowery branch. I used to call this place flowery. I thought it was flowery. But it's flowery. Father, in the name of Jesus, let this place be a river of life flow into this city. God, do a, let, a, let a, send a revival to Flowery Branch, Georgia that people all over the nation will run to in the time of famine. Father, in the name of Jesus, and they will find flowing water. They will find the, the river of life. They will find a a house that is proclaiming the miraculous power of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, say amen. Amen. The Bible says, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord in verse 5. And he went and he dwelt by the brook Cherith. And that is before Jordan. See, the brook Cherith was, was was a stream that flowed into the river Jordan. And the ravens brought him... Bread and fish in the morning, and bread and fish in the evening, and he drank, drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Why did the brook dry up? Because there was no rain. It didn't say God dried the brook up. I heard preachers preach, and God dried the brook up. Doesn't say, remember, God's not a God of cause, He's a God of predestination. Remember, we talked about that. God doesn't stand up there and cause everything to happen. Sometimes sin causes its own thing to happen. For the wages of sin is death. God's not up there judging you every time you sin. Sin brings its own judgment. But God gets to blame for everything. When your river dries up, don't blame God for it. It may just be this stinking sinful world that we live in. Doesn't say God dried the brook up. Said there was no rain. So the brook dried up. It's, it's, it's consequence and actions. Okay, how saved you are, your actions produce consequences. Don't blame God. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of life. If it's not good and perfect, it ain't from Him. Are you here? I done out preached my welcome already. Amen? Don't blame God. Just happened. Yeah, but where's God? Well, read the next verse. Oh, whiny tail. When the brook dried up, God didn't say, all right, fend for yourself. The Bible says, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath which belongeth unto Zidon, and dwell there. See, God's always got another place for you to go. If your brook dries up, if your job dries up, if your situation dries up, don't get mad and leave church and cuss God. God's got another place for you to go. Cherith means, uh, the brook Cherith, Cherith means to cut away. Zarephath means a place of healing. Y'all can get that later about lunchtime. 
The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get these there, if I have blown Zion, dwell there. Behold, watch this. This is what I want to get into. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. He said, I've already told a widow that she's going to provide for you. You need to underline that in your Bible. Mark that in your Bible. I have commanded a widow to take care of you. Let's read on. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came into the gate of the city, behold, the widow. Not a widow, not just any certain woman. Your Bible says, the woman. The woman what? The woman God said he already told, he already spoke to, to provide for the prophet. The woman. See, that's what you need in your life. You need kingdom connections. You don't need to just be connected to anybody, but there's somebody you need to be connected to. Somebody say amen. you got to protect your relationships. If you're going through a tough time in your marriage, you don't want to be hanging out with a man that just went through a divorce. Hello. Does this thing work? Do you hear what I'm saying? If you're having a tough time in your marriage, you don't want to be hanging out with a single woman who dressed like a floozy. You need some sense about you. Just make it plain, preacher. Just make it plain. Somebody say amen. You need specific people. I ask the Lord all the time, God, I pray kingdom connections in my life. I pray kingdom connections in Stephanie's life. Noah and Reagan's life, our staff, kingdom connections. Not just anybody, that's somebody. Watch this. I commanded a woman to sustain me. He goes, he walks through the gate of the city. He didn't wander around for this woman. He didn't have to look for her. When he walked through the gate, bam, there she was. Watch this. There she was gathering of sticks. And he called unto her and said, Fetch me, I pray, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called unto her and said, Bring me, I pray, thee a morsel of bread that is in your hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go and dress it for me and my son that we may eat and die. I got a few concerns with this passage of Scripture. Number one, it don't sound like to me that that woman has heard from God. God told the prophet, go to Zarephath for I have told a woman, a widow, to sustain you. Elisha gets there and she acts like she don't know nothing about nothing. He said, here I am. Go get me, go get me some, some bread and get me some water. She said, I ain't got nothing. Seemed like to me, if God told her a prophet's coming, feed him and take care of him, she would have had no questions to ask. Let me get back to that in just a minute. Another thing that aggravates me is the prophet looks at the widow and says, bring me the morsel that is in your hand. Now, a morsel means a part of. It means a piece, a a piece of the, the whole pie, but it's just a piece of it, just a morsel, just the grain that is in your hand. So she's carrying it around, and it's a piece. He said, bring me the piece of your pie. Bring me the the little part of your destiny that's in your hand. And watch how the woman responds to what God has blessed her with. She didn't say, I don't have a morsel. She knew she had a piece. But she said, I don't have a cake. I looked up the word cake to see if they were both the same word, and they're not. Morsel means a piece of the whole thing. Cake means the finished product. The reason we can't do nothing for God, we can't do anything for God, is because we don't realize that our peace
piece of our cake is all God needs. We start looking and say, well, I don't have the whole cake, so I can't do anything for God. God don't need you to have the whole cake. He needs you to take what is in your hand and God will provide the rest. But we become people that lack faith because we want to see with our eyes the miracle before we act on it. Somebody say amen. Bring me that morsel. I don't have a cake. If I was the prophet, I'd have said, I didn't ask you for a stinking cake, woman. Oh, ye of little faith. I know you don't have a cake. I want what is in your hand. Moses said, I can't go. I can't go, God. How do I know that I can go? How do I know you're with me? Who do I tell them send me? God said, what is in your hand? He said, ain't nothing but old stick in my hand, Lord. I ain't got nothing but a stick. God said, throw it on the ground. The stick turned into a serpent. Moses jumped back and said, I didn't know that was in my hand. Because what is in your hand may be a stick, but when you turn it over to God, it comes alive. It, it turns into something that you didn't even know. God said, now reach down and pick it up. And he picked it back up and he turned back into a stick. The principle is, whatever is in your hand and whatever you can find will only be a stick. But when you give to God first. Let me skip ahead a little bit because I'm done into my preaching now. The Bible says, he looks. the prophet looks at her and says, I want you to go into your house and I want you to bake me a cake first. That's the problem with the church. That's a major problem. Because we got our life, our destiny, our blessing at the forefront instead of our neighbors. We look at how God is going to bless us instead of how can we bless Him. We look at how the church is supposed to be blessing us instead of how we are supposed to be blessing the church. The miracle would have never happened until she gave to God First, not AT&T, not Charter, not your bank, not your car payment. I don't care if you amen me or not, I'm preaching the word this morning. Somebody say amen. amen. We want to give to God second and third and fourth and then complain why we don't have no cake and we stuck with a morsel. Two reasons you're stuck with a morsel. Number one is because how you view what God has already blessed you with. If you look at it as a morsel, then it will be nothing more than a morsel. If you look at your life as less than and lacking, you will always be less than and lacking. That's why you got to grab your 12 I am's and start declaring all your life. I am here. I am blessed. I'm carrying a cake. I'm going around providing for everybody, not just myself. understand I want to make more money I want to I want my stocks and my investments to be blessed not just for my house but I want to build orphanages not Covenant Connections Church I want Stephanie and I to be able to build orphanages I want Stephanie and I to be able to pay off house payments that are not our own that's my vision for us I don't want all this income to, 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 just to eat it up Buy me a new Ferrari? I don't want no Ferrari. I got a Chevy Silverado. What more could you ask for? You understand what I'm saying? But we want stuff for the stuff. Somebody say amen. And all the while we look at what God's blessed us and we, and we look at it as less. You understand? Well, I'm 50. I thought I'd be further along in life than I am. You got about 30 or 40 or 50 more years and you're halfway through your life and you're complaining about what you have not done. Get your mind right. Say, bless God, I got 40, 50 more years. I'm going I'm to tear this thing up. My, my ladder shall be greater than my former. I may just have a morsel now, but I serve a God that is more than enough. He'll take my morsel and turn it into a whole buffet of cakes. My God, woo, hallelujah, I feel it. 
Glory to God, you bet you've had a McDonald's life, but God's about to turn you into a into a what what's that place? A golden corral. You know how you go to the Golden Corral? You know, at McDonald's you get an apple pie. And that mother, you know, that mother, it ain't no more bigger than a minute. You can eat that apple pie in two bites. Some of y'all won. You go to Golden Corral, there's red velvet cakes, there's cheesecake, there's cherry cake, there's ice cream. I'm going from a McDonald's apple pie life to a gold corral life where my God come to me and I got all this stuff you can choose from. Come on, somebody. Tired of living a McDonald's life, but I ain't going to sit around going, oh, I'm just a McDonald's. The devil is a lie. Somebody say amen. I'm not going to be restricted by what is in my hand because I'm in his hand y'all don't want to say nothing y'all don't want to say nothing she don't look like to me that she's talked to God but God already said I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you I'm trying to show you about the word of God for your life Just because you haven't heard it doesn't mean God's not speaking life over you. Good God Almighty. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean God is not fighting for you and the Word of God is not alive over your life. She had no idea she was supposed to sustain a prophet. No idea. But God was already providing for her future. And she thought that this was her last day on earth. She thought she was going to gather a couple of sticks. She wasn't even going to get a handful of sticks. She said, I'm going to get two sticks. I just need enough to rub together to produce a little flame. My God, the American church. That is the view of the American church in 2012. I remember in late 1990s and early 2000s over over just a few miles down the road at the Gainesville, uh, the Rock of Gainesville over there. And my God, you couldn't keep the people. We couldn't sit the people. We couldn't sit them. They were all up in the church. And every time we went, there was miracles and power and, 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 and things would happen. Other churches from all over the nation, literally, you know how I got hooked up with Pastor Lance Johnson Firehouse Ministry? He heard me preach at the pastor's conference called Level 5 in 2000 at, at the Rock of Gainesville. He said, I can't tell you anybody that preached. I can't tell you what they taught, what was said, but I can tell you exactly what you preached. I said, praise the Lord. God, I know what I preach. But there was power. There was a hunger back in those days. Now we're more hungry to see what we can get away with and still say stay saved. That's why there's no power in the house of God. Somebody say amen. Can I talk to you for a minute? You know, we preach about apostles and and prophets and teachers and evangelists. But your Bible says in one, in one scripture over in, I believe in Corinthians, it says that the, the church of God is built on the apostles, prophets, teachers, and miracles. We got the prophets. We got the apostles. We got the teachers. Where's the miracles? Tell you why we don't have miracles. We don't have miracles because we're not attractive enough to the presence of God to, to, for Him to be able to use us. We're fine with just doing churchy church. I'm not okay with doing churchy church. I want the power of God because I'm tired of Ken's hurting. I'm tired of Monica's going to uh, chemotherapy. You understand what I'm saying? I'm tired of divorce running rampant in the churches of God. And separations and divisions running rampant in the house of God. It's not because we've got some of the best teaching going on on radio stations and TV stations that we've ever had. It's not the teachings. We lack the power of the living God behind our teachings. 
I pray in the name of Jesus that, that, that the power of God so fill this house that there may be two or three or four or five Sundays where I don't even get to preach. We come in and the power of God hits this place and miracles happen and lives are changed and the, and the hookers are running to the altar and the drug addicts are running to the altar and... and they're not going to run to a sermon. Sermons are for Christians. The power of God and the miraculous is for the sinners. It's not for Christians. It's for sinners. Somebody say amen. But we say we just got a little morsel. I don't have a cake. He didn't ask you for a cake. He said, bring what is in your hand. Somebody say amen. Now watch this. She says, as the Lord liveth, God liveth, I have not a cake in my hand, but a meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. Elisha said unto her, fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make, make me... Thereof a little cake first. Bring it to me. And after make one for you and your son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel. The barrel of meal shall not waste. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail. Until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Watch this. Two things and I'm done. Number one. She heard from God. God said, I have commanded a woman to sustain you. Right? God did not visit her in a dream, did not visit her in a vision. God gave direction to the widow from the prophet. He, the man in need, out of his own mouth, he told the woman what God had to say. Life and death are in the power of your tongue. Huh? Maybe those around you are not on fire for God and doing what God wants them to do because God's waiting on you to speak out of your mouth destiny into their lives. But to do that, we got to quit gossiping and backbiting and judging each other. I'm preaching today. Somebody say amen. You create the world around you by how you view what God has blessed you with and by what comes out of your mouth. Do you understand what I'm saying? When did God speak to the widow? He spoke to the widow, <coughs> excuse me, when the prophet told her the instruction. And all she did was obey. Amen? She goes and she says, we're going to die. Me and my son's going to die. I was sitting in my office the other day, and if you're taking notes, the title of my message, subject of my message today is The Widow Can't Die. I was sitting in my office. I was relaxed in my Georgia chair. You know, Georgia has got to be Christian. Because Georgia keeps getting a shaft. You know, Christians, we're done wrong. We're ridiculed. We're mocked. We're persecuted. I don't know how Georgia can go from number three to number seven behind a team we beat. I'm getting on my soapbox. But I'm still under the anointing right now. Amen? Which tells me you can't afford to lose any game. You can't afford to lose any game. Somebody say Amen. Well, I'll just get rid of him and find me another one. You're going to drop from three to seven. You're turning in your 80% that, that you do like about your husband for the 20 you don't like about your husband. You're going to get a joker that got the 20, but he lacks the 80. And you're going to wish you'd have played a little harder. Somebody say amen. Amen. Yeah, I spiked it. I, run, I got a touchdown on that one. 
The widow can't die. Here's my question. Elijah represents the word of God. Remember, I've taught you this. In the Old Testament, a prophet represents the word of God. The Holy Spirit was not given without measure because Jesus had not been glorified. Therefore, God would only use certain men to do certain things that we now had the luxury of being partakers of all of it. We don't need a Levite priest to go into the Holy of Holies for us. We can go because the Holy Spirit lives in us and we're under the cleansing blood of Jesus. Somebody say amen. We have a high priest. Amen. We don't need to go to the priest for our healing, for our miracle. God was God that healed them. Amen. Jesus took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. We are filled with the Spirit of Jesus through the person of the Holy Spirit. All we need to do is call on Him and receive our healing. Do you understand that? But in the Old Testament, prophets represented the Word of God. The widow woman represents the church. The Word of the Lord comes to the church and says, I know you're tired, I know you're weary, I know you don't have what you think you need you have, but take what you have and offer it to me. Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The word of the Lord comes to the church today. The word of the Lord is coming to Covenant Connections Church saying, I want to use you to sustain the prophet. Here's my problem. The American church, we are losing our voice to the world. Why are we losing our voice? Because we look too much like them. The Bible says, come out from among the world and be you a separate people. If all the world is running around here wondering about tomorrow and, 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 and willing to step on anybody to get to where they need to get to and, and they're, they're acting like idiots and they're cussing up a storm and they're telling dirty jokes and, they're, and they're, they're drinking liquor and getting drunk and they're doing all these things. And now the church people are doing the same thing the world does. And we're losing our voice. The widow is dying. She said, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to scratch these two sticks together. That's about all the fire the church has anymore. About every three months, we'll get enough expectation. We'll get enough. We'll get down and out enough to grab two sticks. Where two are gathered in his name. We'll grab two sticks. We got enough faith to grab two sticks. We don't have enough faith to sustain a move of God. We got enough faith to get a little spark. And on a Sunday morning, the Lord shows up. But next Sunday, we don't have enough power to sustain a move. I'm praying for God to do something in this house that sustains the move of God. That in 2023, 2033, 2043, if the Lord tarries, Covenant Connections Church is still thriving and moving and shaking and people are coming to the flowery branch to get their water and to get their bread. I say amen. Bring, bring me that sword right there, Pastor. The widow cannot die. Why can't the widow die? Who is going to provide for the prophet? If the widow went into her house, baked the cake, and died, who would have sustained the man of God? You ought to find somebody else. No. God called her to do it. And that's our mentality that has killed us. Ah, oh, somebody else will do it. Huh? Somebody else will be there. I know Pastor David's out of, out of, ain't going to be at service today, but somebody else will be there. I ain't got to go. We've got 400 people in our church. 
That's the mentality that's killing us. The fact is nobody can do what you can do. Because nobody, God has not called just anybody to do it. God's called you to do it. And if the widow dies, the prophet is not sustained and the prophet dies. The problem is not that God's word has lost its power or God has lost its power. The problem is we got the widows on ventilators. The widow, the church, is on life support. And we need preachers to get back to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ with power and with anointing and with a fearlessness that it don't matter what people think. Bless God. God said it. I'm going to say it. Now get up out of your deathbed and rise up, widow. You've got a prophet to sustain. While we play in church, the world is dying and going to hell. Do you understand? You don't see what I see. When I look at you and I think about Covenant Connections Church, I don't see a little church. You understand? I see a gushing river of God. I see chosen people. Here's what I see. We can minister to the Ukrainians because we've got an anointed man of God right there that preaches and talks Ukrainian. So I'm not limited by Pastor David. Send on the Ukrainian speaking people. I got a man right there that can talk to them and preach to them. Send all the Hispanics you want. I got the preachers in the house right now that can preach to them. I don't have to do it. I got widows right here that can preach to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? We got it here. Send the women that don't want to hear from a man. I'm sick of men. I'm tired of men. I don't want a man. Don't need a man. Don't care about a man. I ain't going to a church where a man stand up there and tell me what to do. That's fine. I got women in this church that can out-preach this man. And they, they're more fit. Now watch what you ask for because I, I tiptoe around the tulips a little bit. I got women in here that will blow your world up. So bring them on. Bring on them old hard men. Because we got men that have been through hell and aren't afraid to weep under the power of God in front of anybody. Somebody say amen. We got it in the house. Us. But this has to be our priority. We got to minister to the house first. Somebody say amen. And I know some of you are judging me right now. Oh yeah, what about you? God's dealing with me on things. Ain't your job. I went to that church the other day, and I, 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 before I preached Sunday night, I said, Pastor, I want you to, for, he's been pastoring 28 years at that church. Started it 28 years ago. For 22 years, I've told you, couldn't get it over 70 people. 22 years. In the last six years, they've grown over 700 people. In six years. I said, Pastor, what would you do? Because he goes, you know, that's the question everybody asks me. He says, I ain't done nothing. He said, I stayed faithful. I kept preaching to the 70 like I was preaching to the 700. Before I knew it, I had 700. He said, I just stayed faithful. The widow refused to die. Do you understand? Look around you in the last two, and a, two years. Do y'all know, what's today's date? Do y'all know two years ago today we started Code at Connections Church? Two years ago this Sunday. It was the 12th. Right? It was December 12th because it's the same time we opened the Rock of Delonicus years earlier in, in 1999. Two years ago today. Look at the people around you that aren't at church. That have backslidden. Can't find them at church, but you could have found them last night at the bar. 
Come on, somebody. Look at the people. You wouldn't believe the people that have left our church because I preach about sin. Isn't that funny? I thought that's what I was supposed to do. You said you, you, you keep saying about drinking liquor and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. Really? Do you leave your wife when she says pick up your dirty underwear? I'm leaving. can't believe you told me to pick up my dirty underwear. I mean, it should be something you do anyway. Right? Look around at the people. This place would be two services full if the widow wasn't dying. Somebody say amen. I said, Pastor, I want you to pray for us. I saw him. He told his, his armor bearer, his associate pastor, he said, he told him something. But anyways, they brought out this sword. That morning, he loves collect. He, he, I love them jokers, man. He loves collecting uh, you know, ammunition and guns and swords and all that. He's, he's had this sword. He said, I've had this sword for years. It's called the Solomon Sword. It's got a Star of David. It's got a menorah on it. This side, it's got the Ark of the Covenant and gold. Star of David on it. Got a bunch of designs on it. He said, it's called Solomon Sword. And he showed me five or six swords that morning. But this one right here, I just kept going, my God, I like that thing right there. So as they went to pray for us on Sunday night, he brought this sword out. Many of y'all saw me standing there with the sword like this on Facebook. I got that picture. I'm standing here like this. And they took a picture of it. He said, for years, when my church wouldn't get over 70 people, he said, I'd walk around my office with this sword. He said, I'd swing it at the devil. And I'd say, Mount Airy is God's. And I'd cancel the assignment of hell against Firehouse Ministries. He said, I'd wave this thing around. He said, I've prayed hours with this sword right here. He said, God told me to tell you that I'm transferring the sword from one soldier to another. He said, you know, some people in ministry, they have it easy because a lot of times it's all about who you know. You know what I'm saying? It's all about who you know. You get the president of a bank born again and, and believing in your vision, well, they're going to get most of their people that work for them. You know what I'm saying? About influence. Amen? But he said, you're a soldier. He said it hadn't been easy for you, your life, your ministry. He said it wasn't easy for me. It hadn't been easy for me. He said, but God says today I transfer this, so, this sword from one soldier to another. And he says, God said, what took me years will take you months. And I just started weeping. What took you years, me years will take you months. I took this sword. I took this sword. And I hung it in my office. And I didn't like where it was, so I took it down. Because it's special. You know what I'm saying? Found a place right there on my little... Box, what do they call that? Trophy case. Put it up there. Told the kids, don't mess with that thing now. Maybe one day I'll take this sword and hand it over to Noah. Maybe one day I'll take this sword and hand it over to you. You never know. But I do know this. I pray in the name of Jesus when it comes time for me to hand over this sword that I don't find a dead carcass. Because the widows died. Who's the widow? You are. You are. Why? Your husband died. Now he's raised again. He's seated at the But we haven't been united with him. We're without our husband. You're the widow. And it's time for you today to take what's in your hand and offer it to God with 100% of your ability and your talents and your time and your effort and your spirit. And if we'll all do that, this church will blow up. Not only numerically, that's secondary. I even prayed last night and this morning. I said, God, if we've got your spirit, the people, the hurting people would be attracted to that. So I don't pray for the people to come. I pray for the spirit of God to come. Do you understand? 
The widow can't die. You cannot die. It is not okay for you to get a divorce. It's not okay. I'm mad. You don't know what she did to me. You know what? It's not okay. Do you understand? If, if a year ago, your husband did something wrong, and you have forgiven him, a year later, you cannot divorce him because what he did a year ago. You know why? The moment you forgave him, God forgot about it. It was over. You cannot come back a year later and go, eh, well, I got grounds to get a divorce because remember what he did a year ago? Uh-uh, honey, you forgave him. It's the power of forgiveness. It's cast as far as the east is from the west. Got to come up with a new excuse. Ooh, Lord, I'm done. I don't, I don't out, I outstayed my welcome today. Somebody say amen. We're raising, I've been telling you, we're raising up soldiers, right? Amen? You, get, you go in the military, they'll bust your chops. Military people tell me, I was sitting with one of them, and he said, you know what they do for the first six weeks? They tear you down. They make you feel like you are the most worthless person on the face of the earth. And then the rest of your career, all they do is build you up, build you up. Because they create you into who they want you to be, not society. Sometimes it takes the preacher, it takes me to take this sword out. You understand? But I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to build you back up into who God says you are. I'm trying to get you off the ventilator, church, and get us back living. Say the widow can't die. Point your finger at yourself and say the widow can't die. I can't die. Why? There's a prophet I've got to sustain. There's a word that's got to come from me. There's people you got to touch. You can't die. You can't give up. You can't quit church. You can't give up on God. Shake yourself off. Take those grave clothes off of yourself. Rise up. Let's agree. Let's pray for this house. Let's pray for what God's destiny is on this house and each other. And let's watch the power of God blow this place up. And let's watch this place become the, the, the fountain of cherub. Huh? The flowery branch. And watch people from all over the nation and world run to this house because the widow has come alive. Stand to your feet all over the building. Are you here? One of my officials, I was officiating basketball last night, he said, when do y'all start? I said, 10 o'clock. He said, how long do you go, about an hour? I said, <laughs> I said, bro, we, we usually do praise and worship, about 40 minutes, and take up the offering. I said, shoot, we usually an hour into it before I get started. If an hour could change your life, There'd be people's lives changed all over this nation. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to get through our old thick skulls. But God has spoken things over your life. You may not have heard it yet. But you need to get around people that have heard it. See, that's, that's what a pastor's supposed to do. I'm supposed to hear the Word of God for you and tell you, Go, take what's in your hand and bring me back a cake in the name of Jesus. I don't have a cake. I didn't say you had a cake. You got the oil and you got the meal. You got the ingredients to make the cake. You lack the vision and instruction. <laughs> good God. I ain't preaching good today. You've got everything you need. It's the way you look at it. I'm going to give an altar call this morning. If you're not right with God, this altar calls for you. If you're not born again, if you're not 100% sure, if you died today, you'd go to heaven, this altar calls for you. But I want, to, I want to give this altar call for all the widows out there. All the widows out there that are dying on the vine. All of us, let me say, who've allowed other things to creep in 
and make us judgmental on who we are in God. Make us judge and live our life out of what we don't have instead of what we do have and our potential. Maybe I'm the only one that's going to answer this altar call today. I'm answering it right now. I'm coming to the front. I'm here. Sword in hand. All you widows that say, you know what? I know I got a profit to sustain. I know I got something God's called me to do, and I haven't been doing it to my full extent. But today is the day I'm going forward. Get out of your seat right now and come to this front. And I want to lead us in a prayer. If you're not right with God, I want you to come to this front. If you're backslidden on God, come to the front. If you're not 100% sure you'd die today, you'd go to heaven, come to the front. Well, I'm doing everything I know to do, bless God, but it's all the people around me. You need to come to the front. Amen? That's a judgmental spirit. When you start validating your situation by looking at others, it's judgmental. My associate pastor years ago, he come running in my office. And y'all got to know who, y'all got to know this man, Al, uh, Pastor Alan Taylor, pastors of church down here in Buford. He's just funny as everything. He come running in my office all excited. Big old eyes. Pastor, God spoke to me. I said, really? What did he say? He said, God told me the difference between gossip and hearing from God about somebody. He said, if you think a thought about somebody and it does not motivate you to prayer, it's gossip. If you hear something that does not motivate you to pray for the person, it's gossip. If you say something about somebody and your motivation is not to get somebody to pray for them, it's gossip. I'll never forget that. I believe he heard from God. How about that? All right, widows, we're coming off life support today.